So like I said, tonight we'll be studying in the book of Ecclesiastes, the second chapter. Um, I won't rehash too much of the first chapter, but there's probably a few things that we should uh, recall. This is one of the books of wisdom along with uh, uh, Psalms and Proverbs and uh, Job. Uh, so it is one of the books of wisdom in the Bible. It was written, uh, I, I believe, and many believe by King Solomon. Uh, you can see many references to King Solomon's life. Um, but some, some would argue whether or not it is, uh, but I, I believe it is. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, it's best read, I believe, as an essay, as an argumentative essay. And the question that King Solomon is asking is, what is the purpose of life? Is it to uh, seek after pleasure, after wealth? You know, what, what's our purpose in this world? What can truly make us happy? What can keep us going from day to day? And what a better time to answer some of these questions than the times that we're living in right now. Um, if you remember from our first uh, lesson on Ecclesiastes, looking at the first chapter, there was one word, the Hebrew word, that kind of stood out, and it was the word hevel. Um, don't ask me to spell that. I'm not a Hebrew language scholar, uh, but in my studies uh, through the various lexicons and stuff, there's essentially three meanings to that word hevel. It can mean, as it's translated in many of our modern uh, language translations, uh, meaningless, something that is meaningless. It, it just doesn't have an answer. It can also uh, mean uh, something that is unable to be grasped. Uh, and the example that's given is uh, smoke that's uh, floating through the air if you try to reach out and grasp that, uh, your fingers are just going to go uh, through that smoke. Um, and so there's various meanings uh, of, of the word hevel, and it's used most in the book of Ecclesiastes, although it is used in other places in the Bible. But today, let's turn our focus on Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I do encourage you, even if you got your uh, coffee next to you, uh, your soda or whatever, please get your Bible out uh, or pull up the Bible app on the phone. Like I said, get the kids around. I'm, you know, I'm going to have Danielle get our kids gathered around for tonight's service as well. It's really important that we stay in the Word of God uh, during this time and not give all of our time off um, just to YouTube and, and this world's uh, pleasures, let's say, but you know that we actually spend some time in the Word of God. So let's begin reading today in Ecclesiastes, the second chapter. And it says, I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine. Yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, until I might see what was good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. And then verse 4 it says, I made me great works, of, and I builded houses, I planted vineyards, I made gardens and orchards, and I planted trees uh, in them of all kinds of fruits. I made pools of water uh, wherewith the wood that bringeth forth the tree. He was watering the trees that he built. So he built pools and ponds. And you can just imagine the beauty of this forest and all the uh, aqueducts and the things that King Solomon was making here. He was making, making, making. That word made occurs several times here. And he says, not only that, but I got me uh, servants and maidens and servants born uh, in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. He had it all, so to speak. 
So I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasures of kings and of the provinces. I gat me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And then verse 10, he says, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept them not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all that labor. So before I go on here any further, I just want to kind of talk about that opening of Ecclesiastes 2. So here we see that uh, like many people do, King Solomon, he had the wealth, just immense wealth. He had, uh, you know, he could get anything that he wanted. And the first place that he went to see if it was going to provide him pleasure and enjoyment and be the meaning of life was the exercise of his wealth and of pleasure. Now, we'll see later in some of the chapters in Ecclesiastes and uh even a little bit in this chapter, we'll see that uh, King Solomon sees some of these things and looks at them vicariously. He experienced them, experiences them through other people's experiences. He, he observes. But here, like many men do, he has to go out and see for himself whether or not pleasure is the meaning of life. So it's not something that he's going to do vicariously, but he's going to do by his own experience. Because remember, he has everything uh, in the kingdom to, to put into this pursuit. So uh, <clears throat> we see here, though, in verse 2, uh, that he uh, did dismiss early on some forms of, of pleasure that he was not going to uh, to seek after. And some he just dismisses right away. And the two that he really dismisses right away is he says of laughter. You know, he said that, you know, a lot of people when they're having a good time, there's a lot of laughter involved. But here King Solomon, he says, if that is the purpose of my life, he said, that's madness. I would be ready for the asylum if the only thing I did in my life was just to try to laugh. And if you think of it, I, I think uh, back in the times of uh, maybe Elizabethan England, Queen Elizabeth on the front throne, and uh, she has, you know, you see the jesters, the court jesters, their whole life was uh, nothing but to make the queen or the king to laugh. And they got the funny hat and all that stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of those people, we look at those pictures today and we think they're pretty crazy. Well, Solomon came to the same conclusion that all, if all I live my life for is for laughter and a good time, I'm really kind of crazy. He says it's madness. So he dismisses that right away. He doesn't go into that. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, if you think of it, there are people that maybe try to uh, make a YouTube channel based off of that, and all they do is pranks and, and practical jokes on people. And I imagine if they truly lived their life like that, they would have a lot of very angry family members and other people. So it's just not a way of life. But he says, though, of pleasure, I'm not going, he says, I'm not going to stop going down this road, but he says, I have a couple more questions for you. He says, of pleasure, what doeth it? What good is it? So he's not uh, seeking to uh, end this uh, examination. So he moves on, as some people do, to wine. Uh, you know, perhaps there was some meaning in its relaxing effects, its intoxicant uh, effects would certainly bring lots of uh, friends around and it would maybe make him have a more jovial nature. And you hear people that uh, go out to party and drink, you know, that's, that's their uh, feeling is that they're going to have a lot of fun because they're going to be intoxicated. So in a way, Solomon here, he's trying to find out that if life uh, truly will match up to the beer commercials, you know, is it better really to live the high life 
Uh, but he figures out pretty soon, as we see here, that this too was a let down. You know, alcohol was not the answer. You know, people that uh, want to try to uh, use the Bible to uh, justify excessive use of alcohol and things like that, they won't find a friend in Solomon's writing, I'm sorry to uh, say. Because he says, number one, he says that his heart was acquainted with wisdom while he was consuming his wine, so he did not become an alcoholic. Uh, nor like we can think of a story, I like to link uh, to other stories in the Bible, and if you can think of, uh, of the hand of God writing on a wall, you know, do you remember who that was, that, uh, the king at the time? It was Belshazzar, of course. And he didn't go the way of Belshazzar and lose the kingdom while he was uh, fooling around with alcohol and drunkenness. But Solomon here, number two, he places alcohol, if you notice here, under the heading of folly or foolishness, which he'll later state in verses 13 and 14. He says that foolishness and folly, it's inferior to wisdom. It's way below wisdom. He says it's so much so that they are night and day difference. May I better read that just for a second? So if we skip down to verse 13, he says, Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. So wisdom and foolishness are that far apart, night and day apart. You know, one will not ever lead to the other. Uh, they are diametrically opposed. Thus, he is saying no matter how much alcohol you drink, you are never going to walk away from that experience wiser or better off for having done so. So if any of you young people are watching, or even older people, uh, there's a lesson that we can learn from the Bible. You don't have to go out there and live it experientially. You can live it vicariously and know it vicariously through the Word of God. And also, my third argument here that Solomon is not um, purporting that wine or alcohol is the answer is that it would be heavily con inconsistent with his other writings, such as Proverbs 21, 20, sorry, Proverbs 20, verse 1, which says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So we can't uh, justify alcohol consumption based off of Solomon's writings here. So what are the other things that uh, could bring pleasure and meaning in life? Uh, you know, a lot of people, they, they focus on these things, such as hard work and houses and lands and wealth and companionship. Solomon, he sets out to put them to the test as well in this chapter. So we see... This is a, a, a process that he's going through. It's, it's, it's just interesting when you really study this in depth and you start looking at the Word of God, you see that it's a process Solomon's going through here. He, uh, <clears throat> I wonder if his uh, fourth grade teacher didn't assign him a, a, a science project because he does a pretty good job setting it up. In verse 1, uh, he sets up his plan. He says, I said in my heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, with cheerfulness, some versions say. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. I do think it's interesting the way that this is said. You know, Solomon is leading his heart along as if it's a little child. He's leading it along by the hand. He's not being led by his heart. And that's what you hear a lot of people talk about. Just follow your heart. Well, we never want to just follow our heart because we have to go back to what Jeremiah said about men's hearts. They're deceitfully wicked. You know, we can think that we are doing something good because we're following our heart, but yet we are doing something that truly is wicked. We're doing something that may not even seem wicked initially, but it's going to lead us down a path away from God. Follow the Word of God. And that's what actually, uh, spoiler alert, Solomon will come down to in, in uh, the last chapter of Ecclesiastes. But here, he sets up his plan, he leads his heart along, and he says in verse 3, he defines the purpose of the whole study. 
He says, what is, or, uh, till I might see what was good for the sons of men, that they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. And then verses four through eight, after he set up his plan, his purpose, uh, he describes the implementation of his plan. And we'll just go over it briefly, but verses, uh, verse four, he says, you know, I made, the key word made, great works. He built houses, he built vineyards. In verse five, again, I made orchards and gardens. He planted all sorts of fruit trees. In verse six, again, I made pools of water, you know, to water those trees. And then in verse seven, I got servants and maidens. Solomon had all the companionship that one could desire. You know, he did not have to lift a finger in his house if he didn't want to. Uh, you know, I know sometimes uh, some of you mothers, maybe fathers come home and you wish that somebody would have lifted a finger and cleaned stuff up. No problem for Solomon. He had all the people that he could need. Uh, he didn't even have to do anything if he wanted. Uh, verse seven, he says again, I had great possessions. Uh, he had livestock and wealth. You know, I wrote my notes here. He could have flaming yawn every night if he wanted to. And then verse eight, I gathered silver and gold, the treasures of kings. Nobody had ever had this much bling in the world before. Solomon did. And then verse eight here, I gat. I like that old King James uh, English uh, verb there, I gat, or I got me uh, men and women singers and the delights of men. Um, some versions actually go further to say that the delights of men that he's talking about, and it would be consistent with the rest of the Bible, would be all the concubines, of course, that uh, Solomon had. He had it all. But look, uh, he almost sounds uh, like, a, like a child. We have to remember that Solomon was only 20 when he took over uh, the kingship of, of Israel. So, I mean, this sounds like a young man. I made, I made, I made, I got, I had, I gathered, I got, or I got. Doesn't that sound like a, a young man? He's out there seeking pleasure. But he's doing this for a reason, though, and a reason that we can be thankful for today because we can uh, read about his experiences and, and uh, learn from these experiences. So where did all of this... Uh, making, having, gathering, and gadding of the pleasures and treasures of life get Solomon. Was he happy? Was he uh, enjoying everything that he had? Let's go a little bit forward here. We're going to read uh, verses uh, 10 through the, actually 9 through the end of the chapter here. So get your Bible close, uh, pull it up on your phone app again. So verse uh, nine says, so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. And also my wisdom remained with me and whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion for all of my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labors that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Well, that doesn't sound like, you know, what we would expect from having all that money and all those things. Ah, it's kind of a downer, isn't it? Let's go on. Verse 12, and he says, And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man that cometh after the king, even that which hath been uh, already done? He had already done it all. What was anybody else going to add to it, he's saying? Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happens to them all. So listen up here. He says the wise and the fool, same events going to happen to them. He says, then in verse 15, said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I saw in my heart 
that this also is vanity. So even a lot of wisdom, he's now saying, I, uh, that's even vanity there. For there was no remembrance of the wise more than the fool forever, seeing that now uh, which now is in the days to come shall also be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. <laughs> so he's saying here the wise man and the fool are both going to die, and they'll both die in very similar circumstances. So what's the point? So in verse 17 he says, Therefore I hated life because the work that was wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all that my labor, or I'm sorry, yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto a man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? And of course we know of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, he was a little bit more on the foolish side. Yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I have shewed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore... I went about to, uh, because my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and knowledge and in equity, yet a man who hath not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion. This also is a vanity and a great evil. So you could have a great man that uh, labors all of his life for good and he leaves it to somebody that's really going to be wasteful of all that he labored for. For what uh, hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he uh, hath labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrow and his travail grief, yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor, that I also saw, or that, sorry, this also I saw that it was from the hand of God. So if somebody did enjoy their labor, it wasn't because they had done that labor themselves. Solomon says here it was a gift of God. For he who can eat, uh, who, or, or who else hath uh, hastened hereunto more than I? Uh, for God giveth to a man that which is good in his sight, uh, wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail, to gather and to heap up, that he may give to him uh, that which is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. So my question before I read that part was, where did uh, all of King Solomon's making, having, gathering, and gadding of all the pleasures and treasures of life get him. In these verses, he says that there were essentially three outcomes. In verses 9 and 10, he says, first, uh, he was great, and he was more wealthy than any other in Jerusalem. Check. He achieved it. He says, number two, that he was still wise, so that gift that God had given him, he still had it. Check. And he said in his heart, he rejoiced in all of his labors. So there was some enjoyment. Check. But by the end of verse 10, we start to see a chink in this armor of pleasure and wealth. You know, he ends his triumphal moment where he's on top of the world with this phrase. And he says, and this, he's speaking of the rejoicing in his heart. He says, and this was the portion of all my labor. That was it. I got some joy in my heart. Uh, I was famous. That, that was it. So I think back to a story I heard once of, I believe, Augustus Caesar. He had become the uh, emperor of the world. He, the then known world was under his control and command and they had a big celebration for him. And after the parade had ended, he says, is this it? Is this it? 
It was just a day like any other day once that parade went by. He was ruler of the world, but yet he still did not have the joy and pleasure of life. And Solomon here is in this same situation. So the wheels, they fall off in verse 11 as Solomon makes a, a true deep dive evaluation of what he's truly gained. And he says in verse 11 that he truly gained vanity, vexation of spirit, and there was no, no profit under the sun. Essentially, he was bankrupt. You know, he explains in the following verses that his labor had produced, that he thought was producing pleasure. It really, it was vanity, number one, because uh, no one would remember the things that he had done in the future. And in fact, I can't remember if I said this last time or not, but I watched a show not too long ago where there were Jewish archaeologists, very uh, versed in the Old Testament and Jewish history, that even doubt if King Solomon ever existed. There's so little of King Solomon's uh, existence in the archaeological record today that there are people out there uh, in the Jewish nation even that doubt his existence. So the only thing, interestingly enough, that uh, saved Solomon from complete obscurity is the Word of God. Imagine that for a minute. So everything he did to seek pleasure truly was vanity. And then he says it was vexation in spirit. Vexation because he could not control what would happen with his wealth or what people would do with it after he was dead. It wasn't going to prolong his life or anything like that, uh, and he could not control it. I remember a story that I wrote down in my notes here. Uh, I remember when I was a child, I had this Lego set, and not just a Lego set, many Lego sets. I loved Legos, and I had them all set up in our basement. I had an entire Lego town. Now, if any of you know me, I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not the type that uh, likes to joke or play around, so all those Lego sets had their purpose. If it was the truck stop Lego set, it was to be the truck stop. If it was the uh, police station uh, Lego set, it was meant to be the police station. <laughs> so that's the type of individual maybe I've always been. But of course, my uh, friend, uh, probably when we were seven or eight years old, he came over and he had a little bit different view of the seriousness of playing with Legos. Uh, you know, he first thing he did is he came by and he popped all the heads off of like 20 of the guys and made some monster that had heads, you know, maybe 20 heads stuck on it and it just ruined my world. Well, you know, this happened in a larger sense to King Solomon. He saw a head and he saw that somebody was gonna be playing with his treasure and they were gonna mess it up because they weren't gonna do what he wanted to do with that stuff. So therefore it was a vexation in spirit, as a vexation, it was not a comfort to him. And then he says it was no profit under the sun because even though he had all of this pleasure, treasure, all these wonderful memories, whatever, uh, it was not going to prolong his life. He was going to die just as the fool uh, that had never sought after all these things, let's say, uh, was going to die. Paul, you know, he reminds us in 1 Timothy 6, 7, he says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Uh, that's where, where the same conclusion that Solomon comes to. So in the end, Solomon, he realizes that the pursuit of worldly pleasure does not bring that lasting joy, and it does not transcend or go beyond this world. You know, so therefore, it cannot be the meaning of life because it doesn't go beyond this life. So pleasure, if you're seeking after it, uh, just remember, it's not that type of pleasure will not go beyond this life. So let me put it in this way. You know, you can draw up, if you think of the world out there that has many wells out there that you can draw a bucket of, of uh, pleasure up out of, you can draw as many buckets of pleasure out of the world's wells you want, but you're not going to taste one drop of heavenly satisfaction from any of those. And it takes Jesus Christ to give you the true heavenly satisfaction that you're looking for. 
But Solomon did see some light here. It wasn't all darkness in this chapter, if you noticed a second ago. He noticed that there were some that had some satisfaction in an honest day's work. In verse 24, it says, It's good for a man to eat and drink and make his soul enjoy good in his labor. But you have to see, though, where the source of this satisfaction is coming from. Solomon was looking, will money and wealth and all these worldly things bring me pleasure? No, it wouldn't. And he said the people that are having pleasure and doing their hard work, they're not getting it from the hard work. They're getting it from God. And look what God gives them. Maybe they're just looking for enjoyment, but God, he says, will give them wisdom. He'll give them knowledge and he will give them joy. So just another example of where God is giving more than what we could probably have even asked for. And isn't that true in so many things in our life as Christians today? So note that none of uh, these carnal pleasures that Solomon and many in this world today are seeking, uh, none of them brought what they hoped it would. But luckily, God will give to us what is good, the Bible says here in Ecclesiastes, in His sight and not our carnal-minded nearsightedness. So God will give us what's good in His sight, that wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But there was also a warning here. He says that the sinner is experiencing all that same toil and drudgery in his labor, but without the benefit of God's goodness. Take note here. He says, in fact, uh, you know, I was thinking, actually, in my mind, I was thinking of a man pushing a mine cart, and it's very heavy. He's pushing it through the mine, and then one day while he's pushing that mine cart, he falls over the, the edge of the uh, cliff or the into the mine, and he dies. And down he tumbles, never he's seen again, and some other man comes and he pushes his mine cart along. That's kind of the the uh, scenario that Solomon's talking about. That is the center in this life. He's just gathering up for somebody else, but he will never experience the joy that God can give him. So what is important for us, though, to get out of Ecclesiastes chapter 2? You know, I think that the important part here comes from verses 11 and 12. That seems to be the turning point of this chapter. And look at the words he used. He says, I looked, and then in verse 12, I turned myself. And it both of those are actually the I looked and I turned myself. Both come from the same Hebrew word. And I had to get out my lexicon and look this up again. And the word is pana, pana. And it means to turn about, to to do an about face or to look at something, to turn your face, your eyes, or your heart towards something. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something good. You know, in the, in the Bible, that word is used for people who turn towards God, and it's also used for those who turn towards idolatry and evil and other things as well. But it's a turning. It's interesting, too, that this, uh, this word here can also uh, mean to, to bring order out of chaos or to... In, to set your house in order. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, you know, this was this term is used when the uh, angels of the Lord, they come to Abraham, and Abraham tells his servants to set the house in order, get ready to receive these guests. And it's that word, panah, so to set your house in order. So if you're like Solomon, in conclusion here, if you're like Solomon and you find that you're building houses of pleasure and treasure that offer no shelter from the storms of life, come to Christ. You know, read His Word, obey His commandments, and He said in Matthew chapter 7 that He will plant your house's foundation on the solid, sure bedrock And when those storms of life come, your house will stand. If you find maybe you're like Solomon here and you're planting uh, trees of worldly pleasure and you're hoping uh, that this pleasure and companionship is going to bring good fruits and bear good fruits, but you find that truly it's only bearing bitter fruits and bitterness in your heart, well, come to Christ. You know, He will fill 
uh, you with the Holy Spirit, that you may bring forth the fruit of righteousness. And if you find that uh, the pools and cisterns of your hard labors have gone dry and no longer provide the refreshment that you desire, then come to Christ. You know, it's Christ. He said that he will cause springs of living water to burst forth from you and that you will never, ever thirst again. So don't listen to this world. The world's going to tell you that you need to put some more pizzazz in your life. You ever heard that word? Need some pizzazz. You need to do something to make yourself more popular. You need to uh, seek after wealth and prosperity. You need to be everybody's friend and have everybody love you. You don't need more pizzazz, but I would say from our study tonight, you need more pana. We need to stop and we need to think. And I think the Lord has really put us in a position right now, young, middle-aged, old alike, where we can pana. We can stop. We can turn, we can think. Look at it. Right now, our world has come largely to a standstill. We don't have to rush out to ball games anymore. We don't have to, uh, many of us don't unfortunately have to rush to work anymore. Uh, all those things that maybe were holding us back from getting close to God have been slowed down or maybe even stopped. Now is a good time to turn to God, to look to God, to read His Word. Consider if our lives match up to the Word of God, and let this be a turning point in our own lives that we get closer to God.